and Professor Shirley Dyke, <clears throat> who is a professor both in the School of Civil Engineering and the School of Mechanical Engineering. <clears throat> We're very happy to be here with you today and hopefully you'll find the session in very informative. Uh, we're going to spend the first uh, uh, 20 minutes or so of this session in presentations from the four panelists, myself included. Uh, we're gonna go in order. Uh, first is gonna be uh, Professor Williams, uh, then uh, Professor Yahan Shahi, and uh, Professor Dyke followed uh, Professor Yahan Shahi, and I will close. Then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, just to allow continuity uh, and allow for everybody to make their presentations, please hold your questions uh, until the, uh, after all the panelists have presented. Uh, you may wish to send them via the chat box, in which case uh, we can take them in the order they arrive um, and uh, at the end of the four presentations. With that, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Williams, uh, Chris, Good afternoon, Your, the floor is yours. Hello, I'll try to share my presentation here. All right, can, can everybody see the presentation? It, yes, uh, can you switch the screens yeah. to Ryan? We're looking at your at the presentation mode. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, not yet. <clears throat> I'm still seeing the two slides, but that's okay. If, if you want to go ahead that Mayo. way. How about now? <laughs> uh, disappear. Let me try it again. Sorry about that. I think we'd have this down by now, doing this for seven months or so now. <laughs> Believe me, yes. Uh, we are zoomed and <clears throat> now you can go to presentation mode and I think we'll see only one slide. Yep. Okay, Is that, that's good. Yes. All right, great. So um, thank you, Julio. Um, so my name is Chris Williams, and I am a uh, um, assistant professor in the uh, School of Civil Engineering and, of course, in the Structures Group. And I'm just going to give you a really brief research summary of the type of research that I work on. And um, thank you all for coming, and uh, I look forward to uh, your questions um, once we all uh, get done presenting. So this is just a slide that just gives you a basic um, overview of the, the research interests and focus that I have. So you can see at the top of the screen, it says that my focus is on reinforcing pre-stress concrete structures. Um, and primarily, the, you know, all the research I do is, is somehow related to that topic. Um, and uh, it could be design and behavior related, um, where you know, it's related to the design of the structures or maybe more of the fundamental behaviors. Um, most of my research um, is centered on large scale structural testing, not all, but a lot of the research I do. Um, and that's a lot of the focus of my talk today. Uh, it seems like a lot of my research tends to, to, to fall into bridge engineering. Um, that's not necessarily all of it, um, but it, when, we, uh, when you look at pre-stressed um, concrete research, a lot of that falls into bridge engineering. Um, I also do research and repair and strengthening of the existing structures. I um, actually have an important test tomorrow that we're doing uh, with the FRP strengthened uh, bridge girder. And uh, then uh, I like research that has a direct impact on engineering practice. So where I can see the result of my research quickly implemented, it, whether it be um, maybe bridge engineering practices in the state, or maybe it's um, all the way to making an impact in code provisions um, that would impact design around the country or around the world. Um, so let me, um, first of all, just start um, and talk about Bowen Laboratory. So Bowen Lab is a shared lab space um, that uh, you're probably already aware of. Um, and a lot of my large scale testing, or I, I would say all of my large scale testing takes place here at Bowen Lab. Um, and this is just a, a picture of the, the high bay lab, the whole building in itself, I think with all the office areas and everything is around 66,000 square feet. So it's a very, very large facility. Um, and we have a lot of capabilities that are, are unique um, that we are able to do here at Purdue. So just to give you an overview of some of the tests I do, I just showed you some interesting pictures here on the next few slides. Um, a few of my research projects here recently um, have involved taking bridge beams or bridge girders that have been in service for decades um, and then loading them in the lab to failure or in one project repairing them. I'm seeing if we can regain strength due to deterioration, um, loss of strength due to deterioration. 
Um, but this is a project that has been wrapped up here. Um, I, I guess it wrapped up uh, less than a year ago. And uh, we, we're looking at a pre-stressed box beam bridge. It's been in service for decades. Um, it's probably 50 or 60 years old. Um, and what was amazing to us is the deflection that you can get out of these beams. Um, very ductile behavior. Um, we did not fail this beam. Um, we pushed it almost all the way to the floor, as you see, and it didn't fail. Um, so we were we definitely learned from this project that um, you know even though these girders are very old, um, they still perform very ductily. And we also looked at uh, different um, corrosion and, and issues like that that we saw in the field with these box beam bridges. Um, load tests is another aspect of the research that I've done. And here's a example of a box beam bridge being load tested with this uh, loaded dump truck. Um, and you can see um, down here under the bridge, you know, we put sensors to, to measure deflection. So not only can research um, be in the lab, sometimes it can take you outside the lab um, and doing load tests. And that this is just, this is not just um, specific to me. We have other uh, professors and, and researchers that would uh, do similar, similar things out in the field. And uh, here's just a couple other tests. And you see the arrows coming in that show how the specimens were being loaded. And um, uh, the PhD student just defended his, his, his Defense, had his defense uh, last week on, on this project. We're looking at uh, the behavior of these frame corners um, under closing moments in the loading um, condition that you see here. Um, and this is directly related without going into too much detail um, with uh, something that was uh, a new code provision in the, the 2019 edition of ACI 318. Uh, and then in this uh, um, specimen that you see over at the right, it's a sheer friction specimen. So if it's loaded, um, as shown in the figure, you end up getting a shear failure, direct shear right across this um, interface. And what we're looking at is the impact of grade 100 reinforcement, which is of course higher strength than our typical grade 60. And the effect of uh, the behavior of, of under shear friction um, when you implement and use a grade 100 reinforcement. Um, so you see here in this picture, no concrete, <laughs> um, but at the same time, this is related to concrete. Um, because uh, this is a post-tensioning rod in this setup that you see here. And uh, this, in the field, this post-tensioning rod would be embedded in concrete. This is stainless steel. And what we were looking at, we had this, we tensioned this rod and locked it off at a, at a tension um, and let it set for a thousand hours, which is about a month and a half. And what we were looking at is relaxation effects, which is the reduction in stress at a constant strain. So um, I just showed this to show kind of the, um, where, where reinforced concrete research can lead you to actually test and steel. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to show that as another example of uh, research I've done within the past few years. Um, so that's all I have. I, it's a brief introduction and uh, I look forward to um, your questions uh, later on. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for being so timely. Um, now I would like to invite to uh, Professor Jahan Shahid to make his presentation. All right, thank you. Will you let me? Okay, let's see if uh, just one second because it's just giving me some interesting. Um, all right. Well, it says later. Um, <coughs> can you see my screen by any chance? Oh, no, probably no. now you should see it. No, now we do. Okay, wonderful. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Mohammed Jahan Shahi. Um, uh, basically, I'm also an assistant professor in civil engineering. Um, our area of research is uh, basically using robotics and artificial intelligence for autonomous condition assessment of structures, because as you know, for structural systems, we have different phases. We have the design phase, the analysis phase, the construction, and once you construct a structural system, you need to maintain it. So what we provide is health monitoring of the structural systems. So basically, in that regard, you know, as part of the motivation, as you may know, the current grade for America's infrastructure grade is D plus, it's almost failing. 
and you can see the grades for different infrastructure. So aging infrastructure is a very serious uh, matter in the field of civil engineering. And our philosophy is to have something similar to human health monitoring, where you, you know, would have sensors connected to a human, collect data, analyze the data, extract useful knowledge, and decide whether the person is healthy or not, or what is wrong with that patient and how you can fix it and so forth. So we try to implement this vision and philosophy to the structural systems. When I say structural systems, uh, it's not only buildings and bridges, it could be planes, ships, wind turbines, sewer pipelines, offshore platforms, you know, spaceship and so forth. So basically it can apply to a variety of different structural systems. And as you can imagine, we have different structural systems uh, and also different uh, you know, failure modes, different mechanical, uh, uh, different material. So in that case, you may need to have different you know, non-destructive evaluation techniques. So what we do is basically um, these days you have very relatively good sensors and good capability to collect data and archive it. But the, the bottleneck is interpretation of data. So that's what we do, basically using uh, machine learning techniques and robotic techniques uh, and basically try to interpret the data like videos and images that you capture or the acceleration data that you capture from accelerometers attached to a structural system so that to decide if the structure is healthy or not. So in the next few slides, I will just give you a glimpse of just the application of some of the work that we do. Uh, the first the slides mainly are on robotic side when, where you have like a camera that collects videos and images and we analyze the data. So our work is mainly on analysis part of the large amount of data that for instance, UAVs can collect. The first application, for instance, is inspection tools, as you can see for this bridge, instead of having human inspecting the bridge, which is time consuming and tedious and very subjective, as you can see, this guy is hanging here or there's a lift here, you may have robotic systems or UAVs collecting data and uh, analyze the data to de detect where, where the damage is, if there is a damage, where the damage is and how bad it is, the severity can be quantified. Uh, more, uh, more specifically, we have developed crack detection and quantification algorithms for both concrete structures and metallic surfaces of nuclear power plant reactors, corrosion detection for steel structures, uh, analysis of the videos captured from sewer pipelines that we have about 800,000 of uh, sewer pipelines. And basically, there is this type of peak robots that you can send them inside the pipe, collect videos. And instead of having a human going through all the videos, video frames, basically the computer goes through the frames and provide a probabilistic report and tell you where is the damage with some confidence level. Another example is um, flood risk mitigation. In that regard, we collaborate with colleagues in the industrial engineering department. And basically what we do, we need to know the attributes of the buildings in an area. In that regard, we analyze the Google Street View images. So we have developed algorithms that can autonomously go through Google Street View images and they have been able to provide, uh, we have been able to provide 780,000 building uh, information for 780,000 buildings in the state of Louisiana. And they are currently working on the risk assessment of those regions. Um, another example, this is from Bowen Lab, where you have a UAV that for instance, collect data of a, you can imagine of a bridge every three months. And um, the system has the capability to detect and quantify damage. Like for instance, you can see the same crack has been cra uh, tracked over time. As you can see, these are showing the same, the, the, the white pixels represent the same crack uh, from different eight different inspection rounds. Um, another project is the, uh, damage detection of ro on roads. Our students put together a sensor system of a few hundred dollars and they have developed a system that can identify and detect like potholes. You have the GPS information. Now you have a cost-effective approach for uh, I would say uh, more frequent inspection of roads. Um, another example, having robots that can go inside buildings after an earthquake for earthquake reconnaissance based on deep learning techniques. This is another uh, topic that one of our students uh, work on that. 
And here is an example of like, instead of using images, it's gonna be more of acceleration data for model updating and the structural response prediction. So in one statement, if you ask me what I do, it's data analysis, and it has lots of application, not only for structural engineering, for other disciplines within civil engineering. And a very good test bed that we have, and our team is involved with, is the, involved with, is the Resilient Extraterrestrial Habitat Institute, where basically we would have smart, habitats say on Mars or moon, where if there is a meteorite impact, the system will have robots and sensor network, and it will try to identify if there is a damage, if yes, where the damage is and how bad that damage is. So with that, I think Professor Dyck uh, will elaborate on this topic in the next few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And now I would like to invite uh, Professor Shirley Dyck to make her presentation. <clears throat> Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So what I'd like to talk about is a couple of things. Um, first of all is my group. Wait, let me turn on the, my camera here. Uh, first of all is my group is called the Intelligent Infrastructure Systems Lab. And secondly is the Resilience Ext Extraterrestrial Habitats Institute, um, which is a NASA project that we have here at Purdue that's involved in many different departments. So first of all, uh, my group is called the Intelligent Infrastructure Systems Lab. We do have a lab. Uh, it's inside Bowen Lab. And what we're really focused on is looking at how to minimize risk and improve resilience. And we do this through adding technology to systems. So that could include control technology, trying to put dampers inside of buildings to try and understand how to minimize the responses of those buildings. It could include sensors and trying to understand damage um, and when damage is present in buildings and how can you capture the damage so you can understand future lifetime of those structures. But it can also include um, things like model updating and things like real-time hybrid simulation, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, the, the photos that you see here are, one is related to visual inspection and what we've really been trying to do is to develop visual inspection methods that are readily implementable, that we're not trying to um, replace humans with visual inspection capabilities, but rather we're trying to work with humans. So we're trying to extract regions of interest from structures so that we can put them right in front of the inspectors without them having to need to climb around on the structure and uh, by doing that, we can we can put things right in front of the humans and they can actually have the ability to uh, do their inspection and compare results to previous inspection results very quickly. Another thing that we're looking at is on the right hand side of this is uh, classification of images. And we do this because whenever there's a natural disaster, there are teams of engineers that go and visit these buildings and they try to understand what happened and they try to improve building codes based on what they see. And in order to do that, we need to be able to take that data and put it into a format so that they can understand it and use it quickly. So again, this is a problem of the humans interacting with the data. And how do we allow humans or give humans the power to very quickly extract information from this, these images? Those are, that's kind of the thing that brings these two areas together um, we all talk about artificial intelligence and how it's changing the world, and that's great. Um, but true artificial intelligence from beginning to end, soup to nuts, is, is not going to be around for quite a while. So what can we do today that's going to give humans the power to use these artificial intelligence concepts readily um, so, that, so that we can improve what, what engineers do? So the second or really the third field um, is hybrid simulation. And hybrid simulation is the idea of taking physical specimens in the lab and melding them with computational models. And we've been doing this in earthquake engineering for about 40 years. And when we do it in real time, we call it real time hybrid simulation. And that is something that's only been around for about 10 or 12 years. Um, and it's an emerging field and it requires people understand the physical specimen and how it's gonna behave, 
testing capabilities, how do we test stuff in a laboratory, computational modeling, and then the control side, how do we actually control our hydraulic actuators and get them to do what they, what we want them to do in order to test this. And so if you take the computational side and your disturbance, which could be an earthquake, and you mix it with the physical substructure, you have uh, a, a control loop, a feedback loop. And that's what we're actually doing. And so if you think about an e-defense shake table uh, that could test the biggest structure in the world, we can't do that. So what we have to do is we have to break it down into parts of the structure that we can test. And we learn lessons and do that. So this is a photo of the laboratory where we have a, a reaction wall and we can do real-time hybrid simulation in that with the specimens that you see here, some buildings and such. In the Reth Institute, we're focused on similar concepts. And this is 22 faculty, um, 12 of which are at Purdue in different fields. And we're looking at extraterrestrial habitats. And the idea is that resilience is not just reliability or efficiency or redundancy, but it's a way that holistically we can have our systems bounce back. And just like that's important on earth, it's important in space habitats as well. And in space habitats, we have to bring all the lessons that we've learned over a thousand years here on earth and apply them to the future, right? To apply them to what's gonna happen on the moon or on Mars. And we have a hostile environment. It's worse than any environment that we could possibly imagine here on earth. It's worse than the earthquakes and the, the hurricanes that we have here. We have a complex habitat system where propagating, where disturbances propagate through and, and faults uh, cause disasters to happen. And we're trying to figure out how do we deal with that. And we also um, have uh, a complex system. This is this is just a, an image showing what an ecless system might might look like inside of a habitat system. Whereas if there's damage to the habitat itself and it hits this life support system, ecless is life support. It's going to cause tremendous havoc in that system. And and here again we we have that human side. So humans are. Uh, both the creators of the disasters and the ones who fix the disasters in these in these environments, as well as the robots. Um, so so there's a lot of things to learn about how we can use robots and how we can uh, convey information to humans so that we can keep our habitat safe. Um, so this is just an ending slide with the vision for um, the the Reth Institute and what we're trying to do. So. Uh, Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just like uh, uh, Professor Williams and Professor Jahan Shahi and, and Professor Dyke, um, I, from time to time, do work in the uh, Bowen Civil Engineering Laboratory. My area is structural engineering. Um, and uh, I've been involved in research dealing with natural hazards. Um, natural hazards, um, as we uh, define them within the context of the National Science Foundation that funds our research is uh, in terms of earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, windstorms, and uh, associated uh, problems or natural hazards of storm surge in coastal areas as a result of those uh, windstorms. Uh, I'm currently the director of the Network Coordination Office for a large uh, scale civil engineering research infrastructure that is funded by the National Science Foundation. It's a shared use infrastructure which allows access to researchers from all over the world to uh, state of the art laboratories. Um, rather than showing you a video, what I'd like to do in, uh, uh, in the interest of time, is just briefly talk about another topic of research that I'm currently pursuing, and that's the topic of accelerated bridge construction. Um, in the United States and abroad, one of the key items with regards to uh, maintenance or retrofit or uh, replacement of existing infrastructure is the impact that it has on the public. In bridges, for instance, that is represented by delays in traffic and congestions and whatnot. 
uh, research focused in that area is uh, directed at minim minimizing the time that a particular uh, road network is um, down because of uh, it's being repaired or replaced. Um, most of the work has to do with precast elements uh, and then the assembly of those elements to achieve uh, the desired structural performance. And as I said, what is the problem that this method is trying to solve? Precisely this, the time that is wasted in your car as you traverse the city or you go to the place of, of work and, and business. Uh, now that basically concludes my presentation. Um, and um, I'd like to now open the topic, uh, the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes left. So um, I, uh, I have seen some questions in uh, the chat box. So I will act as the uh, relayer of those questions. Uh, I, there's one here from uh, David Olat Juni, Olat Tun Juni, or Ju. Uh, he is at wondering, does project funding from organizations such as NASA prevent international students from working with certain faculty? Um, I think this uh, is directed to either Professor Dyke or Professor Yahan Shahi, um, whoever would like to take that. Yeah, so I, I can answer that with regard to NASA and the RETH project. Um, I, there, there are some projects, but these specific projects that I think all of us have talked about today are not restricted in any way to students that are international. So there are some, but I don't think that we have those. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David, for the question, David. Uh, the other question is uh, from Avish Shek. Subedi, he's asking a general question. How does one measure, besides the number of citations, the value a research project creates in the world? Um, um, this is for any of the panelists or all, uh, if you would like to all answer that question, um, it's open. Okay, I, 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 I guess I'll- <laughs> Go ahead, Mohamed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think research, in my opinion, it has a different spectrum. Uh, some research is more applied, so you may immediately say, see the, um, the results, say, being a, like, what, in my opinion, like what Chris mentioned, his work is fantastic in that regard. Um, some other are very abstract and more mathematical and so forth, and some of them are in between. Um, so, you know, it depends really. Sometimes you may have a new, very good, uh, you know, fr mathematical framework and you do not get that much citation, but it might be very elegant work. So in my opinion, um, you should see if, uh, uh, what are the, probably you should talk to the faculty and see what is the application of their work. Where do they, uh, they have impact, for instance. Uh, in my case, I mean, I can give you an example, okay? For instance, for the case of the road uh, condition assessment, uh, we've been trying to work with the city of Lafayette here near Purdue to incorporate these systems into buses, for instance, or police cars. So as the um, cars go around the town, they can collect data. This will you know, uplift the condition of the road. So um, this is an, one example that I can mention from related to my work. And the other one is, you know, crack detection for nuclear power plant reactors, for instance, Westinghouse uh, from Atom, uh, General Electric are interested to evaluate our approaches to see if they can move them to uh, practical applications. Um, and I would say that citation uh, is one index, but it, as you mentioned, probably you had in mind, that's not the whole story. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Chris or Shirley, you want to add to Mohammed's response? Yeah, I, I agree with what Mohammed said. I think he answered it very well. Um, and I think it, I think impact, it's just a, there's no one um, metric to, to give impact by any means. Um, and I think it, I think 
if you have a room full of, you know, if we're talking about professors, 50 professors, they'd all have a different <laughs> definition of impact probably just because the research we do impacts the world around us in different ways. Um, and so uh, I, I, citations is one metric, but it's in a, a big pool of many other factors. And uh, I think to determine the impact of research, you just need to sit down with people involved with it and they can tell you what impact it has. So I, I think Mohammed answered it very well. Thank you, Chris. Um, Shirley, if you want to add to that or? Well, I, I'll make two short points. One is that um, in different fields, there's different numbers of people reading the documents and thus the number of citations is field dependent. Uh, secondly <coughs> though, which is probably more important is that sometimes impact doesn't happen for 20 or 30 or 40 years. There's been many cases of something that was developed and nobody really saw the, the value of it for a long time because the technology wasn't ready for it. The fax machine was developed something like 30 years before they started putting them in offices. And I know fax machine is probably around before you guys were mostly born, but, but that was, <laughs> but it, it takes time for certain things to, to become, to recognize their value. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. Let me take first, Margaret. Uh, what is the research process like? How are graduate students assigned to research advisors? Is it based on what positions are available at the time? Uh, any of the panelists is welcome to take that one. Uh, I'll give that a try. Um, so, so Margaret, the, um, the idea is that it's best to try and communicate directly with people whose research that you find interesting and see if there are opportunities um, that would be interesting to you. Uh, applying is, is part of the process and, and you know, writing your, your statement, but it's at least as important, especially for people who are interested in PhD work to try and directly communicate with people that you would like to talk with about your research. Um, the process is very one-on-one, -on -one, I would say. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, Faith um, asks, would you say sustainable development is the greatest determinant of the kind of research currently being conducted? Again, uh, any of the panelists? I, I would say that sustainable, sustainability, sustainable development is a driving force in research today. Um, and there's, you know, a, it's, it's something that definitely we, we all need to be thinking about. But I, I wouldn't say it was a the greatest determinant um, for, for my research. A lot of it just stems from there's a problem in the field and we need to fix this problem. Um, and, uh, you know, in the long term for the safety of the public and for uh, efficient use of taxpayer money, <laughs> a lot of what it comes down to um, with the research I do. So, I, I mean, the, the world is full of, I would say the world is full of problems in the structural world that we still need to explore and also advancements in the structural engineering world that may have a sustainable ability component, but you know, there's ways to make, um, you know, make things leaner and, you know, save money and things like that, that uh, also, and, and just understanding fundamental behavior better um, that will lead to all kinds of development um, that, you know, it's, it's a more of a, I guess many more reasons than just one reason, whether it be sustainability or something else. So um, yeah, that, that, that's the answer I would give. A very good topic to be in. <laughs> we have research related to sustainability right now because it is such an important topic. Um, but uh, you know, there, there's many research needs out there. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, I would just add to that that um, this problem, sustainable development, and the big problems ahead for us in civil engineering are actually not unique to civil engineering. They require collaboration, 
multidisciplinary teams of researchers. So one of the things you might wanna consider, Faith, is that as you think in terms of your future as a graduate student, think about the fact that you'll be working in teams with students from other disciplines and that, um, that, that is what is needed now to tackle the, uh, the problems that society has. Um, Mr. Gores asked a question. Uh, many of the research projects discussed involve a large amount <clears throat> of data analysis through various tools, UAVs, et cetera. From a single engineering, a civil engineering basis, how difficult is to integrate the use of this technology with actual civil engineering design practice? And is there anything you would suggest to prepare for said research? Um, I believe that this might be directed to Mohammed or uh, Professor Dyke. Mohammed, you want to take a stab at that one? Yes, I think that's a very good question. You know, in my opinion, what we're trying to do is to train the future or the next generation of civil engineers who would have interdisciplinary background. Uh, basically, in addition to having very strong background in, say, civil engineering, structural engineering, and mechanics, uh, for instance, I can give you an example of the students that we have. They typically, typically take courses in electrical and computer engineering or computer science. For instance, machine learning, pattern recognition, if they are working in computer vision type of stuff, computer vision or image processing, if they work with accelerometers, they, work, they take courses like in signal processing and so forth. So in the first look, it seems to be, oh, it's so different from my previous background in civil engineering. But what happens is that it's broadened your vision because now you take a couple of courses outside civil engineering. You work with engineers like electrical engineers. They typically solve problems differently. Now, once you pass through that stage that you build up your background, you have more tools at your disposal. So I believe the future uh, is uh, we need, in addition to the disciplinary engineers, we need interdisciplinary engineers who can deal with, with you know, technology that comes out. You know, this is the era of data. So one of the intentions of, uh, I would say, the advantages of having this type of topics is to prepare the next generation of civil engineers who would be prepared to adopt the technology. As you know, civil engineers are typically considered as, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the say, for instance, the Department of Transportation. They are very conservative. But I believe the next generation who is, who is more exposed to like this technology type of things, they know what, uh, how these systems work. They know the, you know, be under the hood, uh, how the data analysis algorithms work. They are more will willing to adopt these technologies. And the idea here is not to just superficially use some black boxes. We really have students that take, take courses and some of them, if they're interested, we support them to have the second degree in electrical engineering. Some of our students have a master's degree in electrical engineering, and that also helps them to get job, uh, you know, uh, and, and increase their chances. So we really want them to understand what is under hood happening with these algorithms, not just some tools. So they will have in-depth knowledge in that regard, both from civil engineering and computer and electrical engineering. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Stephanie, we have one more question. Time for one more question? Or? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay, so there is one uh, more question from Michael. He says, just as Professor Dyke has advised on contacting faculty, I have recently contacted some faculty but received no response. This gives me a notion of an uncertainty of opportunities to pursue a PhD degree in structural engineering. Please, what is the best way to contact a faculty and get a response? Um, would can, any of the panelists want to take that one? I, I can try to answer that. Um, and then I, I saw also that I think uh, Professor Dyke was unmuting, so I'd like to hear what she had to say too. But uh, I, I think I think part of it is what you said um, that if you're if you're looking to apply for next fall, twenty twenty one. Um, a lot of us don't know what we'll have, you know, a year from now when it comes to opportunities for PhD students. Um, but also, 
I, maybe this is the approach you're taking. If it is, that that's great. But my advice would be, you know, we receive many emails from students, um, and it's it's just not possible for us to reply to all of them, unfortunately. Um, but the student, the the emails that stand out to me are those that say, you know, this, you know, I I know what type of research you do, and I am interested. This is, uh, you know, why I'm interested in it, or maybe this is what the background I have. So it's a very personalized email, um, specifically written, um, you know, to me. <laughs> so I know that it's just not being sent to everyone, but they specifically said, you know, I like Dr. Williams's research and I'm going to contact him and see and find out more about it. Not necessarily seeking a position because I may not know that answer, but hey, I want to just know more about what type of work you do and the opportunities there may be here, you know. Um, and then if you don't hear from anybody, does that mean you shouldn't apply? I don't think so at all. Um, because like I said, um, you know, once you get the application, you know, and once we get the application in, that's, and once it becomes closer to, you know, to make that decision of who we admit, that's when we're going to look more closely based on your application of who we want um, to potentially work for any open position. So I definitely wouldn't, you know, if you're interested in the school, um, I, I would definitely encourage you to apply and, and not just base it on the responses that you're getting from, from emails. Thank you, Chris. Shirley, do you want to say something else? Uh, you know, Chris did a very good job of responding. I, I would say, yes, it's a matter of something in the email that draws my attention, which means that it's individual. It's not a sort of a blanket statement that you'd write to everyone. And secondly, the timing. Um, honestly, it's a little early right now uh, for applications for next fall. And it's starting to get to that time. Um, but right, but people right now just don't know if they're going to have funding. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't send the email. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't send it three times or four times. And maybe you'll get an answer sooner or later from <laughs> some of the folks that you do respond to. But it does help to really have an understanding of what that person does and, and a little bit of idea as to why it's interesting. Even if it's just, it's not, you're not sure if you want to do it, but you just want to know more about it. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dyke. And uh, I see that there is a session at 6 p.m., uh, the closing session. And, and so um, maybe we can take one last question, Stephanie, or are we? Yes, that's fine. One last question. This one is from David. Um, how much experience do civil engineering students need in a different, in a different academic background to pursue multidisciplinary research. This goes for any of the panelists here. Yeah, I can take a crack at that. You don't need any experience. You just have to have an interest in, in wanting in being willing to look up, look at other fields and and um, and and bring different ideas into the research from other topics. So it's more about being interested than about having that experience. Thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions. You've seen the responses uh, for the panelists from several of the uh, individuals asking questions, thanking you. And I would also like to thank you and uh, the graduate school, Stephanie Porter, for hosting this session. And to all the participants at some point in time, and they're still hanging with us, we had over 20 participants. So thank you and uh, best wishes uh, in your very important decisions ahead for graduate school.